Hello, everybody. Mr. Mark with you. And in this video, let us uh, return to our discussion about graph straightening or linearizing data. Like, how do we take a table of data that is not linear and turn it into a linear graph whose slope can be used to find a uh, desired quantity? So in this case, what we're going to do is use this table of masses. So these are masses over here versus the period of a spring that the mass is oscillating on to figure out the spring constant. That is the desired value here, the spring constant of the spring. Now, if you're watching this at a point where you don't know what that means yet, that is OK, uh, because I'm not really interested in you learning uh, physics concepts here. I'm more, more worried about you enter, uh, learning the physical scale of taking nonlinear data and making it into straight data. So this prompt right here is taken straight from an AP exam lab-based question. So like this is exactly how it might look on an AP exam. Like use this data, figure out how to make it into a straight line, use these columns, tell me what you're going to graph, et cetera, et cetera. So our starting point here needs to be, well, what is the relevant physics? And so because I, I've learned a physics or two, I can tell you that the equation that relates these two variables, that is the mass on a spring and its period, is the period of the spring, 2 pi square root m over k. Now, that looks complicated and scary that because I'm choosing a hard example to show you so we can really illustrate the skill that you need. So the question now is, how do I get this thing to look like y equals mx plus b. And so from algebra 1, you know that the equation for a straight line looks like this. And so the first step, step number 1, if you will, is to get one variable on one side and then everything else on the other side. And so you might be able to start off with step 1 already being accomplished. So let's inspect. Um, t is one of my variables. T is already on the left side of the equation, so step A is complete. I don't have to do any rearranging in that regard. Step B, if you will, <laughs> is then to isolate the second variable on the other side. In this case, M. And so if I inspect my equation, I see that I have an M right there. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite it so that M is isolated. So what I mean by that is T equals 2 pi. And then I'm going to take this square root K term. And I'm going to write it separate from the square root M term. It's so like I'm going to kind of group all the things that are not M in a single spot. So 2 pi over the square root of k, kind of like that, and then times the square root of m. And so all I've done is I've just rewritten this thing so that m is isolated. It's kind of sort of by itself. And when I do that, now the thing starts to look more like this, where I have one variable on the left side. That's my t. I have the other variable on the right side in this case, square root m, and then everything that's left over is either part of the slope, m, or part of the y-intercept. So in this particular case, the y-intercept is 0. This would be like plus 0 out here. I'm not going to write that because that would confuse me. But the plus b part being 0 tells me that everything left over is equal to the slope. And so if I kind of write it like that, and, and often what I'll do is I will kind of group the slope in a parentheses or a bracket or something like that to pi over the square root of k and then the square root of m now it looks kind of like y equals mx plus b where this is my y variable all the stuff in the bracket is the slope and then square root m this would be my x variable so one, one thing that's kind of important to realize is that if a set of numbers is a variable, in this case m, functions of that set of numbers is also a variable. 
And so m is a variable, square root of m is also a variable. And so up here in these blanks for like, what am I going to graph? Um, I'm going to go ahead and put t on the vertical or y axis. And I'm going to put square root of m on the x or horizontal axis. Um, so I go back up to my table now and go, I've got t's groovy. Those are done. So this is what's going to go on the y-axis, but I don't have a column of square root m's. And so what I'm going to do is in either of these blank columns, it really doesn't matter, we're going to calculate the square root of each mass that we have. Now the unit for the square root of mass would be the square root of a kilogram. Kind of seems ridiculous, but that's okay. We're after something else, not mass. We're after spring constant ultimately. And all I gotta do now is take my handy dandy calculator and then crunch the numbers, do the square root of 0 0.1. When you do that, you get 0 0.32, square root of 0 0.2. When you do that, you get 0 0.45. And just do that for all of these different numbers. Once you've done that, um, you can kind of sort of cover up or, or scratch out almost the, this column right here. Like, I don't need this column anymore. I can cover it up with my pencil. I can scratch it out. Um, don't scratch it out completely because you may want to go back and check your math on those. Um, but I don't need that column anymore. T doesn't depend on M. T depends on the square root of M. And so that's what we're going to graph. And so on our graph, so this is, again, straight from an AP response question. Um, I'm going to put T in seconds on the vertical axis. I'm going to make a scale just like I, I would normally. And then the x-axis is going to be the square root of the mass. And again, the unit for that is square root of kilogram. And I get my scale just by looking at the size of the numbers in that column. So not these numbers, look at these numbers. So I'm going to go up to 0. 0.7. And so 0. 0.1, pretty nice scale on this one. And then I'm just graphing ordered pairs just like we always do. Um, for instance, my first order pair is 0.18 on the y-axis, 0.32 on the x. So we'll go up to 0.18 over to 0.32, and that will look something like that. Here is a neater version that I did earlier. Um, ignore this typo dot over here with a best fit line already drawn. So at this point, all we're doing is graphing data, drawing a best fit line. At this point in our physics career, we should be pretty comfortable with that. Um, the next step is to use that best fit line to do something. In this case, calculate the spring constant of the spring. Um, so we, we can find the slope of a line, just y2 minus y1. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. Um, just as a reminder, remember that when we find the slope of a line, we need to choose two points that are on the line, not just look at the data table. So my best fit line, I've got a decent point right there. Kind of hard to see while it's stretching over. I've got a decent point right there. And so I'm going to find the slope. I'm going to do 0.34. Seconds, because that's my y variable. And then that is 0 0.6, 0 0.6 square root kilograms. Oh, I can't see that. So 0 0.34 seconds and 0 0.6 square root kilograms is the coordinates for my first point. For my second point, that is 0 0.03. Three seconds and point zero six square root kilograms. All right, so pulling out my trusty calculator, 
which turned itself off, unfortunately. Please hold. Doing the first part, or the top part, rather, I get 0 0.31 seconds. Doing the bottom part, we get 0 0.54 square root kilograms. And then dividing 0 0.31 divided by 0 0.54, we get 0 0.5. And the unit here, seconds per square root kilogram, which doesn't mean a whole lot right now. So our slope is 0 0.57 seconds per square root kilogram. Now, the slope is not our answer because our equation that we derived moments ago, we rearranged a little bit, um, the one that looked like this, the the Part of the equation that was in front of the square root m or multiplied by the square root of m was not k. It was all this stuff here. So my next move is to set the slope that we just calculated equal to all this stuff here. And then I just have a little bit of algebra to do to get the final value of k, which is what I'm ultimately looking for here. So I'm going to start out just by writing slope. You could write the number, but writing slope or m for slope would be better. It's unfortunate the slope symbol that we use in math has so many different meanings. Equals 2 pi square root of k. So the algebra multiplied both sides by the square root of k. Square root of k times our slope is equal to 2 pi. So I'm going to divide both sides by the slope. Square root of k equals 2 pi over the slope. And then to get k, I'm just going to square everything. So k is equal to 2 pi over the slope quantity squared. So I know what the value of the slope is. Now I just need to manipulate the relationship we derived a second ago to figure out how to get k from that slope. So now I'm going to clearly show k equals 2 pi is a number. We're going to square in all this. And then just substitute in my slope 0 0.57 seconds per square root kilogram. Get kind of ridiculous unit. I'm going to crunch that number real fast. So, again, back to the calculator, 2 pi divided by 0.57 gives me like 11 point something. And then I'm going to square that. And that gives me 120, we'll call it 122. Um, the seconds is in the numerator, excuse me, the denominator still. And it was squared, so I'm just going to write second squared. The square root of kilograms is in the denominator of the denominator, so move it to the numerator. And then squaring square root gives me just kilograms. So the unit here will be kilograms per second squared, um, which you can also write as a Newton times, or excuse me, Newton per meter. That's how you typically think about a spring constant, but that's a perfectly okay unit right there. We would want to show how we get the units from manipulating the numbers in our relationship. So that is how we go from a data table that is not linear. Like that's what we started with, with nonlinear data. I know it's not linear because I know the physics. So if you're wondering how I knew that, I know that T depends on the square root of M. And again, if we're in a part of our physics journey where we don't know that yet, we will know that. And so this is a physics step knowing the physics to apply. After that, we're just playing math games. We're making the equation we know from physics match y equals mx plus b. We're figuring out what variables we have and then separating them, isolating the one that's got stuff still with it. This guy's by himself. The stuff still with it is either m or b when we graph t versus that thing, in this case, the square root of m. 
Um, if it's times, it's part of our slope. If it's plus, it's part of our y-intercept. And then once we graph it and we get a straight line, applying the slope of that straight line, those are all things we've done. Then it's just a matter of returning to that work that we just did to figure out the meaning of that slope. In this case, doing 2 pi over the slope and then squared in order to get the spring constant. And so that is something we are going to practice doing quite a bit of um, throughout the year in physics, regardless of which physics course you're in. This, this applies equally to physics one and physics two. Um, real quick, I do want to show you that this is not the only way I could have done this. I could have just as easily said that I'm going to keep the two pi with the square root of m so that I have fewer things to, to manipulate at the end. So for instance, I could have written this as t equals 1 over the square root of k, and then kept the 2 pi with the square root, you know, so that might look something like this, 2 pi square root of m, which would be OK. You can do that. Um, in that case, my extra column would be 2 pi square root of m. 2 pi is a number, so that's still the same unit of square root kilograms. Um, and then I would have slightly different numbers over here. So for instance, if I just took that first one real fast and did you know, 0.32 times 2 times pi, I get like 2.0. Um, and that could do the same thing for all of those numbers. So that would make the number crunching part of this a little bit more difficult and tedious, um, but it would make the end parts a little bit easier because I'd have fewer things showing up at the end. You could also potentially arrange this in a way that the, the slope itself is equal to k. In fact, you could do um, a lot of algebra, actually, and get something like uh, thinking of with m equals k t squared over 4 pi squared, if you rearrange it a whole bunch. In that case, you would have k being the slope if you put m on the y-axis and all of this stuff on the x-axis. That's an approach that's more useful if you're working with a spreadsheet where you just kind of want the answer to be the, the slope that shows up on the line and all this crazy math you can make the spreadsheet do for you. So when you're working on paper, like you will for your AP exam, then I would try to keep this part as simple as possible, do a simple manipulation here, and then just figure out the rest, the, the other numbers, when I get to this step here, I'm taking the slope and using that to figure out what I know. Um, but any approach will work so long as you keep the equation fundamentally correct. Just wanted to point that out real fast in case you were thinking, well, are there other ways to do that? Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways you could have written this, which would give you different y's, x's, and therefore m's that are all going to give you the same answer in the Everybody who does this would get about a spring constant of 1.22 uh, newtons per meter. Well, thanks for watching. As always, I appreciate you. We're going to practice this in class. So if you're confused, don't worry. You've at least seen the, the basic outline once um, or twice or so. Um, but we're going to work on this a lot in class. I will see you then. Until then, ta-ta.